Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me OK? So uh, on behalf of my colleagues at NYU and IPK, I want to welcome you to tonight's forum on Sandy and climate change and the future of New York City. Um, thank you also to our terrific panelists for making time to come here. Um, I'm Eric Kleinenberg. I'm the director of IPK. Uh, and I just want you to know that uh, we at IPK are devoted to supporting publicly engaged scholarship, uh, work that is serious in an academic sense, but that also really resonates with people who are interested in advancing knowledge about pressing issues of our time. Um, we are sponsoring all kinds of um, open forums on topics of all kinds around uh, New York City, but this year we've really started to emphasize an urban agenda and to, to focus in on the future of cities and New York City specifically. So please be part of our network. Uh, sign up to get mailings from us. Uh, I, I welcome you to, to future events as well. Uh, I, I think this is obviously a, an especially important topic and occasion. Uh, the, the response we got to this invitation uh, was overwhelming. We originally planned to have this in a much smaller room uh, with far fewer people. Uh, and we are all lucky to be here uh, because more than 1,000 people RSVP'd. Uh, uh, and we had to scramble to find a place that could fit about half of us. So I'm glad that you made it. There'll be probably hundreds more downstairs tonight frustrated. Uh, but we will make this event available on, on video, I hope. Um, I, I have personally been studying cities and, and climate change and disasters for many years now, uh, beginning with a, a book that I wrote about my native city, Chicago, where there was a, a catastrophic heat wave in 1995 that killed 700 people in just a couple of days. Uh, obviously, Sandy was less deadly, uh, but it has obviously been profoundly destructive and expensive, and I think also hazardous to human health in ways that we have not yet fully registered, uh, or that we couldn't understand because so much is, is yet to happen. There are, as we speak, thousands of people around our city who have been displaced from their homes. Uh, there are thousands more who were unable to get the medications that they need that they needed immediately after the disaster, and we don't know what the long-term consequences of that will be. Uh, and, and now we sit at a moment when the cold is coming and the, the mold is coming, and the debate over what citizens and city leaders and the federal government should do is just now heating up. Uh, this is hardly an event that has passed. And I think we're here tonight because we all believe that events matter, but not necessarily in predictable ways. And exactly how an event matters depends on how we react collectively and the kinds of, of things we, we push for. Uh, I'm guessing that you are here too because you hope that um, Sandy, as devastating as it has been, could also prove to be a kind of turning point in our history, uh, a turning point in our relationship to the environment, and in our relationship with the city as well. It, it's clear that the, the path we are on right now is not a sustainable one. Um, the climate is changing, and that means not just a gradual increase in temperature, but as you'll soon hear uh, in more detailed form, it also means more and more intense extreme weather events, whether heat waves or heavy flooding or, or hurricanes and super storms. And frankly, I think we've all learned these last few weeks that New York City is not equipped for the challenge of climate change either. And the truth is I don't think any American city really is right now. Our infrastructure is old and it's fragile. Our communities as strong and resilient as they are are simply overwhelmed by the kinds of attacks of the elements that we saw these last few weeks. Our political system has consistently failed to produce effective strategies for either reducing carbon emissions or for adapting to this age of extreme weather. And something's got to give. So what should we know about this? And what do we need to know about this? What questions do we need to ask? What, what can we do about this? All of these are questions for tonight's forum. But they're not just questions for tonight's forum. These are questions maybe the questions of our time. So it's really a, a privilege for me uh, to share the stage tonight with 
such uh, extraordinary panelists. And I want to introduce them very briefly, and I hope you all got a program when you came in that has much more extensive uh, uh, bio biographies of, of everyone who's here. The first speaker tonight will be Heidi Cullen, uh, who has a PhD from Columbia, uh, is the chief climatologist for Climate Central in Princeton, and um, uh, was for, for some time the Weather Channel's um, only person who was reporting consistently on climate change long ago, so she, she's been on the front lines. We next have um, Klaus Jakob, from, also uh, from Columbia University. He's a, 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 a geophysicist, and, and you've probably read a lot about him because he predicted uh, with kind of eerie precision just what would happen in and around New York City when a, a big storm came. After that, we have Dale Jameson, who's a philosopher and the director of environmental studies at NYU. And then I'll add a few words myself. Uh, moderating the panel tonight is, is Chelsea Clinton. Uh, Chelsea, uh, as you probably know, knows a lot and cares a lot about health and this city and many other cities also, uh, and has been working uh, with many of us here at NYU over the last few years to help us think about how we should uh, become more future-oriented and come to terms with challenges like the one before us tonight. We're all going to talk for about 10 minutes each, have a little exchange with each other, and then open it up and hopefully have a lot of time for a conversation between us. Uh, I, should, I should also say that there are many more events on climate change happening here at NYU and around the city, so please make this just one of the many conversations you participate in over uh, the, the next many years. So without uh, saying anything more, Let's get started. So Heidi Collins first. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for, for coming out tonight. And uh, I will just have to say I've, I've known a lot of these guys on the panel for quite a long time. And, and for anyone who is interested in heat waves, Eric's book on the Chicago heat wave and, and the way natural disasters interface with social disasters, it, it really sets a nice framework for I think a lot of the stuff we're going to be discussing this evening. So, uh, you know, in, in my remarks, you know, just to start, in full disclosure, I'm originally from Staten Island, uh, lived in, in Manhattan for a long time. And, uh, you know, so I guess I take all weather pretty personally and I take climate pretty personally as well. But, uh, you know, I, I think for me, Sandy, was an exceptionally personal event, and you know, I'm still watching what's going on on Staten Island. Uh, and I'm, I know that for, for all of us here tonight, this was very personal. Um, but you know, interestingly enough, Sandy was also this very public moment for all of us. It, it was this moment where you know, our city came under intense media scrutiny. Uh, we were wall to wall uh, with journalists, with folks covering how we responded to the storm, how our emergency managers responded to Sandy, how our forecasts were, how we um, behaved with respect to the, the leadership uh, from our elected officials. So, you know, this was a moment that was deeply personal, but at the same time, incredibly public. And, you know, I know one of the, the framing questions for this evening is, you know, what's the role of, of public institutions, government institutions, and private institutions, and I think that that's really one of the, the big questions surrounding this issue. And, you know, once, once the media leaves and, and the, the coverage sort of stops, the problem doesn't necessarily go away, right? So we are all going to be dealing with Sandy for the months and the years to come, and, and the way we deal with it, the way we, we respond to, to Sandy um, will really speak to, I guess, our values um, as, as public and private citizens, and also to our, our, our collective sense of memory and, and our sense of the future. So, you know, with, with those kinds of, of things in mind, um, I just wanted to, to start with kind of an overview. I, uh, um, so I just figured I would kind of do a little synopsis on, on Sandy um, and, and what an amazing storm this was. You know, so as, you know, as we all kind of lived through this, um, Sandy was pretty, pretty much the worst storm to hit New York City since the city was founded uh, as a Dutch trading outpost in, in 1624. Uh, it was the largest uh, hurricane that we saw at landfall. Sandy was 943 miles wide. 
And uh, Sandy was also among the most powerful. Uh, calculations are about 943 terajoules of energy, which is the equivalent of five Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. So this was a massive, massive storm. And the storm surge component, of course, is what, you know, what we will all remember and what I think my colleagues will spend a lot of time talking about as well. So you know, Sandy basically rode in on a, a nine-foot storm surge, perfect timing, right? Uh, coincided with high tide. So we saw uh, a 13.8-inch storm surge, and that basically broke the record that was first said back in 1821. So this is the worst storm surge the city has seen on record. And you know, as someone who at heart is just really passionate about forecasting on all different timescales, back in 1821, we had no way as, as a society to warn each other about these storms. There was nothing that people could do back then aside from just hunker down and hope for the best. But, uh, you know, but this storm was, was really, really special. And I will say that, um, you know, as, as someone who works with forecasters, this storm was incredibly well forecast. And NOAA and the National Weather Service, the National Hurricane Center, the National Center for Environmental Prediction, our federal agencies did a phenomenal job. Um, you know, this is just kind of a look at Sandy um, on October 30th. Uh, this is Sandy right here. And this is the jet stream, okay? And basically, you know, when it, when it all started, Sandy was a pretty typical late season storm. Uh, typical late season storms, however, basically head out to the east. But the models were showing that Sandy was gonna take a radical left turn. That, that, that this storm was gonna head into the east coast. And I can tell you that it was scaring the bejesus out of forecasters. And what's amazing is that we essentially nailed the landfall forecast four days out. Four days out, forecasters told us that Sandy was gonna make landfall um, in southern Jersey. Now, while all this was going on, in the background, five days out, uh, all of our, our federal agencies were planning on ways to get more information to predict this storm the best that we possibly could. So 600 extra radio sons were sent to get upper atmosphere readings. So basically weather balloons, 600 extra weather balloons were sent up and, and the, the goal was basically, we knew that Sandy was this kind of freakish hybrid storm, right? It was a hurricane that meets up with a nor'easter and so the goal was to send these extra weather balloons up so that we, we could track the storm that was basically coming in off the west coast and, and tracking through Colorado and beyond, right? So. People were trying to get as much information as they could to really figure out what kind of left-hand turn this storm was going to take. The other thing that was done, I just showed you that satellite image, was, which was a satellite image from the GOES-14 satellite. Government actually repositioned the GOES-14 satellite so it could go into rapid scan mode, so they could get even more pictures of this storm, so they could really get the landfall forecast right. And you know, so at the end of the day, we had four days of, of warning. Um, and, and it was really it was really beautifully forecast in many ways, um, but it wasn't perfect, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there was so much devastation and so much damage. And you know, I look at this as uh, as scientists, how do we make these forecasts better, right? And so I'm you know I'm sitting here with my iPad and I'm like, my my uh, that doesn't mean I can use a a, a PC, of course, but uh, you know, there there will come a time when we will have the information that we need to really make the pinpoint forecast that we want. Because you know, at the end of the day, over 125 people died during Sandy. 74,000 homes at least were lost in New Jersey alone. And you know, at the end of the day, that's just that's not good enough. You know, we need to do better. We absolutely can do better than that. And you know, as the trickle down of information comes into play, I think that's, that's part of what this discussion is about. How do we improve these forecasts so that we get the information that we fully need on the ground? You know, and, and I know that folks kind of in my, in my world looked at what, ha what happened in Breezy Point and, and wanted there to be the kind of pinpoint, pinpoint information so that you know, the gas lines could have been shut off, so that we didn't, we didn't get taken by surprise from the fires, right? You know, there, there's still, I think, so much more that, that we need to continue to do. But, you know, we have, we have an amazing 
infrastructure in place to, to forecast these storms. And, and this, is, uh, this is the infrastructure that we essentially pay for. So, you know, I, I mentioned this question of values, and, and you know, so I just kind of put up there as, as um, you know, a, a moment to, to use as comparison, a moment in, in January in 1953 when uh, the Netherlands essentially had its own Sandy. Uh, this was a massive North Sea storm that came in, f massive flooding across the Netherlands. Now keep in mind, two thirds um, of the population of the Netherlands sits below um, below for, below sea level or, or just at sea level. So, you know, this is a country that has dealt with sea level issues for its entire its entire life. Um, and, and this was a real call to action. You know, Eric had asked if Sandy would be this moment when we, we said, okay, we're, we're never going back again. And I think the North Sea flood of 1953 really was that moment for the Dutch. And, you know, I say this is an issue of values because it comes down to who are we and what are our values as, as citizens of, of this great part of the world? And, and how do we protect ourselves and our city? Now, that, that falls into a series of, of decisions that I know that Klaus is gonna talk about. Now, what the Dutch decided to do, um, basically within 20 days of this event, they announced um, the Delta Plan, that they were going to con basically make a concerted effort to protect, um, protect the coasts. And, Part of those decisions were to set standards for what level of flood protection they would build for. So the decisions that they made at the time were that they were gonna build um, sea protection at the one in 10,000 year level. So they wanted to protect themselves from the sea for a storm that had the possibility of occurring once every 10,000 years. With respect to, um, to rivers, they were gonna protect themselves to a one in 1,250 in 1, year event. So, you know, for example, here in the US, when we were built after Katrina, we built to a one in 100 year standard. The one in 100 year standard is kind of what we've set and defined as our values. And I think the question is moving forward, is that, is that good enough for us? Is that, is that how we want to move forward? Um, and I will say that statistically, the return period for hurricanes, right? So you can look at the, the climatological record and you can basically generate some very simple statistics of how often can we expect New York to get hit. Um, basically, the return period for a Category 1 storm in New York is about 20 years. For a Category 3 storm, it's about once every 70 years. And, you know, there's basically 90% chance that we will see a Category 3 storm by the middle of the century. So, you know, we, we just lived through Sandy. The question is, we know it's going to happen again, and, and how will we be prepared for that? So. I think this is gonna be something that we're gonna talk a lot more about, but uh, I think it really comes down to how we envision the future of our city, you know, and how we value the present versus the future, the future that our children and our grandchildren will live in, how we value coastal development versus wetland restoration. Um, but New York has actually been very, very forward-looking. Um, folks like Klaus have been working for a long time on things like um, the, the New York panel on climate change and really trying to, to, to get the kinds of numbers we need to make smart evidence-based decisions. Um, so, you know, this is just a couple of things that are in New York City's plan. Reduce emissions by 30% by 2030, restore wetlands, marshes, and oyster beds. Right now, we've lost, in New York City, we've lost 80% of our wetlands. It's a really important question to think about how we're going to move forward with respect to wetlands. Um, another part is um, making buildings more energy efficient. Thank you. And it's really interesting to keep in mind that here in, in New York City, 80% um, of greenhouse gases are actually generated from our buildings. The national average is, is basically about a third. So our buildings are very energy intensive. And when you break that down further, basically 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity use, electricity consumption, the other 40% comes from, from heating oil, essentially, from heating needs. So making buildings more energy efficient is, is actually a really, really smart thing to do. And then generating clean power. And I think we're probably going to hear a lot about this notion of, of decentralized um, energy, decentralized infrastructure versus more centralized solutions. And I, I remember when I was writing um, a book that I, I did, one of the chapters focused on New York City. And, and looked at, at, one of, at many of the risks facing the city, but um, Ray Zimmerman, who's a professor here, actually talked about how decentralized infrastructure 
actually really makes a lot of sense even in cities. She was like, you know what, I, I love decentralized infrastructure, but I also love cities. And so there's ways to do it. I mean, one of the calculations from the NYC report was that 20% of New York City's daytime electricity demands could come from just solar panels on top of our rooftops, on top of our skyline, essentially. So, you know, it's reimagining, re-envisioning our city and, and thinking of it in a way to, to really reduce risks and, and in many respects, think about decentralizing those risks as well. So I'm gonna stop there and hand it off. That really up? Yes, thank you. Well, thanks, Heidi, for setting us up. Um, with all the special circumstances about uh, Sandy as a hurricane, hurricanes have been around for centuries and thousands of years. Cities have been around only, at least in this continent, for hundreds of years. So. The term natural disasters is a misnomer. <laughs> they are natural events, some are extreme, but they are part of the regular natural process. So the disaster part is us. <laughs> we put ourselves into harm's way and we have disconnected our societies from the natural processes. Uh, natives in the Orinoco River in South America live up high in trees. They couldn't care less at what level the Orinoco River floods. They are adaptable. But when we put fixed infrastructure at a given fixed height, then we become subject to the dyna dynamics of the Earth. And whether it's the natural processes or a partly man-made process, such as climate change and sea level rise, then we are in a double whammy. We produce the hazard or amplify the hazard, and we are vulnerable. With that premise, let me say a few lessons that can be learned from Sandy. We are vulnerable and we know that we are not vulnerable. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, in his foresighted technical approach, no-nonsense approach, appointed a New York panel on climate change, I think it was in 2008, and it came out with statements as to where the climate will go as far as science can predict. And uh, the state didn't want to be left behind, so it quickly appointed uh, in a study that runs under the name of ClimAid. It was sponsored by NYSERDA, by your paying electricity bills, and the small fractions goes into a fund so they can fund meaningful research with the benefit for the state. And as part of this study, a team of people, uh, and I was heading a particular subcategory, namely transportation infrastructure and communications infrastructure. I had the opportunity to make a study what would be the impact of climate change, and in particular of a storm that would hit New York City, and our task was to look how it would affect these infrastructure systems. So we, by serendipity, if you like, took a 100-year storm and put it in the New York Harbor, into the New York Harbor, only on the computer, not in reality, of course. 
And we asked ourselves the question, where would the water go? How fast would it go somewhere, wherever it goes? What would be the impact? How long would be infrastructure systems out of operation? And what would be the impact from these systems being out of operation? Uh, we did not have a chance to look at uh, all the residential consequences because our mission was to look at the infrastructure. So the answers were all tunnels that go under the rivers, East River, Harlem River, of the subway system would be flooded. There would be another tunnel between Queens and Brooklyn under the Newtown Creek that would be flooded. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel would be flooded. The Queens Midtown Tunnel would be flooded. The Holland Tunnel was an interesting question. The Holland Tunnel, our team said it would flood. We discussed it with the Port Authority and they said it will not flood because we put precautionary measures into place. So we settled on an asterisk in the table that said, provided that those measures are effective, it may not flood. <laughs> you know the answer. So what are the lessons from that learned? And I must really say, thanks to the cooperation of the MTA in particular, but also the Port Authority, on the engineering level, they did extraordinary homework to help us to put the information together, and you know, about all the square footage of the ventilation that you all walk over and you know the famous Marilyn Monroe picture and, and all that. Uh, so the water can flow through those sinks, not just through the subway entrances. And given that information we had, which was highly technical, the volume of the stations, the volume and geometry and elevation of all the tunnels, and with the help of six very busy engineering students up at Columbia University's uh, civil engineering department, it turned out that this system would flood within 40 minutes of the 100-year storm arriving. It only needs 40 minutes. Now that's at currency low. And here comes my second lesson because we made projections what the scenarios would be with two and four feet of sea level rise added. Uh, so to look into the future, when sea level will be higher by these amounts, roughly in the 2050s by two feet, and uh, four feet probably around the 2080s, and probably five plus minus one foot by the end of the century. It turns out, not much changes with those sea level rise uh, scenarios. The water still goes where it goes with currency level, of course. But, and here take note of it, what needs right now a 100-year storm will be achieved by a 3 to 10-year storm by the end of century. Why is that so? Because at sea level rises, now you need this much of a storm surge. When you have the sea level to a new base, you need only this much to come to the same flood level. In other words, on a nice sunny day in the year 2100, the water level will be almost, not quite, almost as high as the still water level without the wave action as it was during Sandy. Not quite. I'm exaggerating a little bit, just to hit it home. And then you get storms on top of that. And that's why the frequency of events will go up, because the sea level will provide a new reality on which, on top, weather events like those that Heidi knows more about it, will happen. Another lesson. 
adaptation to these new realities. There are fundamentally three approaches to adaptation, climate change, sea level rise, new temperatures, and the likes. One is protection against them. That's sort of declaring the war on climate change. Another is accommodation. That's more sort of what you learn probably in Chiu Chichu and you know, where you take advantage of your partner's energy and accommodate rather than fight it. And the last is managed retreat. You cannot do adaptation with any and all of those in a mixture. So when you heard a lot of discussion over the last two or three weeks, including from the governor to everybody else, we need barriers. We may very well need barriers, but that's not the ultimate answer because barriers ultimately will become dysfunctional and New Orleans and Katrina is a good example to be modified for New York conditions nevertheless. They have a finite lifetime, a finite functionality and you cannot keep the rising oceans out because otherwise you would have to pump out the Hudson into the ocean. One last lesson that's a lot to be learned yet is everybody wants to rebuild. This is not what we should shoot for. I think we should pro-build for the future, not rebuild. Rebuilding is that we're just setting ourselves up for the same vulnerability before the disaster. We really have to come to grips that the future is not the past and we don't want to do anything right now that our children and children's children will have to live with in which we freeze risk in for them and we really have to think about a transformative approach, how our cities, including New York City, will look like. It's very interesting to see if you look at the census between 20, uh, the year 2000 and 2010, the last 10 years or so, that we have increased our population especially in Manhattan, but all over the city and elsewhere, on the waterfront, we have decreased the population in whole, all high-lying areas. We have cemeteries in the highest points in Brooklyn and Queens. <laughs> I'm deadly serious. <laughs> I think we should switch the living and the dead. <laughs> And we laugh about it, but I think the dead would agree with us that we would be better off. And we can build very nice cemeteries in the lowlands. And our city, I would say, will look different by the end of the century. Thanks. Okay, good, thanks. Um, so, um, I'm going to be very straightforward and I hope fairly short. I'm going to make three points. Two of them are uh, essentially different perspectives on our expansions of things that Heidi and Klaus were saying. And the third point I think is something uh, a little bit different. So, the first point. 
There are two related issues about climate change. One has to do with emissions and reducing emissions, usually discussed as mitigation in the trade. And the other issue is about adaptation. Now, they're closely related, and mitigation is hugely important because the more we reduce emissions, the more we mitigate our emissions, then the less that we'll have to adapt to. But there is a very deep and sobering fact about adaptation that we need to come to terms with. And that is that we're going to have to be adapting to climate change for at least the next thousand years, no matter what we do with respect to mitigation. So this slide that I have up here is from a paper of Susan Solomon's uh, from 2009. Things have only gotten worse since this paper. Um, but essentially what you see here in the, first, in the first graph is on the left you have parts per million of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere uh, at different levels. And what this shows you is what happens if we reach a particular concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and then we simply stop emitting. No more emitting, stop on a dime. And what you see is, um, you know, most people would, would say that if we get to 550 and stop emitting, we'd be doing pretty good. You have to be a real optimist to be at 450. Uh, it only gets worse as you go on up. But essentially what happens is for the next thousand years, uh, the atmosphere hasn't returned to its pre-industrial pre concentrations. Okay, we've committed the atmosphere that far out. The second graph is about temperature. It essentially shows what happens if we get to a certain level of warming from these concentrations and we stop. And again, you see the same thing. Uh, even under the most unrealistic, optimistic scenario, we still have nearly a one degree centigrade warming for the next thousand years. Now, it's the third graph that I want to take, uh, particularly point your attention to. This is a graph about sea level rise, and it only takes into account the thermal expansion of the oceans, okay? The, essentially, the sea level rise you get from warming the oceans. It doesn't take into account anything about ice dynamics or anything like this, okay? Uh, all of which just gets worse, the more we find out. And what you see here in the third graph is under the most optimistic scenario. Uh, you don't even get this downward slope where you're getting temperature, you know, beginning to at least begin to come back to the pre-industrial baseline. What you get is sea levels continuing to expand. Uh, to continuing to rise, even under the most optimistic scenarios, okay? So, um, so it's very important that we reduce emissions. The more we reduce, the less we have to adapt to, but the brute fact is we're in the adaptation game for at least the next millennium. That's the first point. Second point uh, builds on something that Klaus was saying, and it has to do with how we adapt. Now, I'm an academic, and academics are about the last people around who are into ancestor worship. So, uh, so, so I always think it's important, in, you know, when we talk about the ways we might adapt to these extreme events, to, to at least uh, give a little credit to those who've come before. And Klaus made the very good point that we have this portfolio of responses when it comes to adapting to sea level rises, rain, ranging from you know, hardening things, you know, essentially trying to protect ourselves by barriers, by building barriers, whether those are barriers that are out at the entrance to the harbor, whether it's a matter of raising subway stations and so on and so forth. And there's no doubt that there is a lot we probably should do in the short run particularly when it comes to hardening what can be hardened. But um, there tends to be this immediate response to these kinds of disasters to, as Klaus was saying, rebuild. We're not going to be defeated by this terrible enemy, whatever this enemy is, the rising seas or whatever. We're going to come back. We're going to build stronger than ever. Uh, but there's problems with that approach as a permanent solution. Uh, and there are other approaches, often called the soft approach to, these, uh, to, this, to vulnerability. And this approach was pioneered by Gilbert White, who was a geographer, who was reflecting on the events like the Dust Bowl and the droughts of the 1930s. And it was Gilbert White who said, and really Klaus was, was uh, echoing this, that floods are an act of God, but flood losses are largely an act of man. So it was Gilbert White who began to uh, uh, approach this idea that we should begin to retreat from these vulnerable places. We shouldn't just give people piles of insurance money and perverse incentives to essentially rebuild vulnerable structures in the same places, uh, and so on. So we do need to think about some of these soft approaches as well as some of these hardening approaches. And part of the reason, I think, for this 
uh, is because, um, you know, it is very difficult to predict exactly what our vulnerability will be. And once we build to a certain standard, we're committed to that. So it's a very inflexible kind of response compared to softer responses like retreating or trying to recover natural barriers. Uh, many of these structures are also extremely expensive to build, and we're soon going to get involved in all kinds of intense politics around New York, because for much of the country, things like, like hardening New York's infrastructure is going to be seen like the second coming of Barack Obama's stimulus program. So uh, these are going to be very, very uh, difficult political issues to begin to, to, to deal with. Um, the last point I want to make about the soft approach is to show you two slides from my environmental studies colleague, Eric Sanderson. Some of you may know his work. Eric uh, produced this book called The Manahata Project. Uh, and, and so what you see here is essentially historic ecosystems in, in, in New York. So this is essentially showing you where the coastlines used to be, the shorelines used to be, where there were wetlands, and so on and so forth, that we've subsequently lost. Okay. Now, imprint this slide in your memory and compare it to this slide. This slide is the slide of the evacuation zones. And, and what you see essentially is what's happened when it comes to the evacuation zones is the ocean has simply reclaimed uh, the shoreline uh, that previously was there minus the wetlands that were essentially protecting and buffering that area. So there's a lot to think about here, I think, with these softer approaches uh, that I think often are not in the agenda and often get dismissed because we have this idea that it's really all about hardening. OK, so the last point that I want to make is to remind us that we're not in this alone. Almost as many people were killed outside the United States by Sandy as were killed in Sandy. But yet when we talk about the deaths from Sandy, we tend to talk about American deaths from Sandy. Great, there's great vulnerability to sea level rise all over the world, in many cases much greater vulnerability than there is in the United States. So for example, about a two and a half foot sea level rise in Bangladesh uh, will put about 20% of the country underwater and uh, cause about 20 million environmental refugees. Now you might say, yeah, we should care about people in Bangladesh, you know? Um, you know, th this could be a church or a synagogue, and I'm preaching, and you're all good people, and you want to respond. But it's more than that. Uh, Americans are large emitters. We're large emitters of greenhouse gases. The people of Bangladesh, on average, emit 1 50th per capita the amount of greenhouse gases as Americans. But yet, they're suffering some of the most catastrophic responses of climate change. So the message really that I want to leave you with, and really, if, if I could, leave the city with, it's this. There is a great lesson to learn from Sandy. It's a lesson about protecting ourselves, but it's, a, it's, it's also a lesson about the global community, about protecting all of us who are vulnerable to these changes that are going to occur because uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's, if, on the other hand, what we do is we build a hardened lifeboat around ourselves to protect ourselves and to not really think about other people who are going to be suffering the responses of the, of the emissions that we've all been responsible for, then this is really going to be not just a lost opportunity, but really a second tragedy that will have been occasioned by this hurricane. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I should have said when I introduced the panel that, that one of the things we do at IPK is we like to stimulate conversations between different people from different parts of the university world and from outside the universities as well. And so tonight we have a climate scientist and a geophysicist and a philosopher and a, a policy expert. Um, I'm a social scientist. And one thing I want to add to our conversation tonight and to the broader conversation uh, about how we should think about climate change uh, is that engineering and meteorological questions are not the only ones that we have to deal with. Um, in fact, you could take one storm and two different places that are subjected to 
similar kinds of weather, I think Dale made a point like this a moment ago, and get really different outcomes based on the composition of the social structure and the resilience of the networks that sustain us during normal times and determine who lives and who dies during extreme moments. So we need hard solutions probably in New York. We probably need something like a flood protection system like they have in the Netherlands. And we need soft engineering solutions and natural solutions like oyster beds and wetlands and marshes. But we also need to pay attention to our social infrastructure. And I fear that we don't do that adequately. When I wrote my book about the heat wave, the subtitle for it was A Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago. And, and the reason for that is that when meteorologists and health scholars looked at the mortality from that week, they realized that the weather explained only a small fraction of the deaths and even less of, of the illness. So there are these social variables that truly matter, and they need to be part of our conversation here tonight as well. Sometimes in the immediate aftermath of a disaster, we point the finger of blame at an official who doesn't do one thing or another. And I'm always reluctant to do that kind of thing um, because I think this is a, a collective collapse. If we don't understand Sandy and the heat wave in Chicago and Katrina as collective failures, we're missing the point. So yes, Mike Brown played a role in the Katrina story and George Bush played a role in the Katrina story, but it's more complicated than that. At the same time, disasters themselves are inherently political. Uh, there, there's power at work, there's influence at work, uh, not just in what happens after the extreme weather comes, but also in the moments before then, when we determine how we will protect ourselves and what resources we will use, who will get protection, who will not, and where will, where will we do those things. Those are all part of the politics of disaster, unavoidably. And conventionally, we, we ask questions like, you know, who, who did we leave vulnerable? Maybe you, you read the story in the New York Times this week about the decision not to evacuate the nursing homes, which is a consequential decision that affected thousands of lives. We ask why. Who got immediate relief and, and who had to wait? A at what point does a local government confronted with an overwhelming force call in for federal assistance because no matter how many people they put out there, they just can't handle the demand? You know, why did New Jersey call in certain federal assistance before the state of New York? Why was there so, many, so much of a stronger National Guard presence in New Jersey building shelters to house people who had been displaced? Why weeks after the storm did people in the Rockaways not have power, uh, gas, a place to live or get a hot shower? These are political questions we need to ask. But there's a, a narrowness to them. And you know, Dale talked about this sentiment that we sometimes have after a storm like this where we say, we will rebuild, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll build something bigger. And that kind of language should strike a chord with us. It's, it's memorable in part because that's the way we responded to September 11th as well. I mean, at just a, a few blocks from here. And, and the response to September 11th was to say, there is a, an overwhelmingly powerful and potentially destructive force out there that could do us harm and even greater harm again. And so we are going to act in a big way to do something about it, right? We created the Department of Homeland Security, which folded 22 different federal agencies into one organization, 180,000 employees. We went to war uh, in a couple of places, and we remade the architecture of our cities to protect ourselves from something that could cause incredible harm and insecurity. So when Hurricane Katrina hit, many people said, you know, is this time that we start thinking about what it means to protect the homeland differently? Is this the moment to expand 
our understanding of, of what it is to provide human security? Should we protect ourselves from the, the elements from extreme weather with the same dedication and commitment that we have dedicated ourselves to protecting ourselves from, from terrorism? Now that's an open question. That's something that we really need to take on. But let me suggest to you that our investment in dealing with climate change has been paltry compared to our investment in dealing with human attacks. And I wonder whether that makes sense at a moment when these extreme events are becoming more frequent, when climate change threatens to deliver more and more of them. I wonder if that makes sense. I think we need to start a broader conversation about what kind of homeland and human security we want and what we are willing to invest in collectively to deal with the reality of climate change. Now, climate change is a tough thing to talk about, and we've known about it for a long time and debated it for a long time, often as an abstract matter. But increasingly, we are starting to connect climate change to extreme events, to disasters. You know, careful meteorologists and forecasters like Heidi have always been reluctant to say, Sandy is about climate change. That's an event that's produced by climate change. Or the heat wave in Chicago or in Europe is about climate change. We don't want to name a, 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 a relationship like that, and for good reason. But we can certainly say now that we see this increased probability of catastrophic weather. And I think we can say that um, this is something that we, we, we need to take on and connect. The disasters are related to climate change, and, and, we, and we need to, to do something uh, about that. But there's a, a problem. When we start telling the scariest stories about what climate change might do, you know, when you hear Klaus talk about the future of, of New York City when the sea rise, the sea levels go up to what, two feet, four feet, six feet or more, we get scared. And we actually know from research in social psychology that if people hear a story about climate change and in which doom is forecast as a, as a near certainty, they get overwhelmed and their likelihood of denying climate change spikes. Their commitment to doing something about it diminishes because they'd rather give up. When we focus on the things that we can do about it, the reasons that one city does better than another city or one neighborhood does better than another neighborhood in the same storm, we see a very different kind of reaction. People get interested. They want to know what they can do. So that places us in a bit of a quandary, right? Because we don't want to be naive about this. We don't want to issue false hope. Right? Don't worry, just build the, build the seawall and put a gate in front of the subway system and everything's going to be fine. We know that's not right. But how can we think about the, the best cases? How can we look at the places that have done exemplary work to mitigate or adapt and try to model them? I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't think anyone on the panel or any of us here tonight have the answer for that. But you know, many people believe that the future that's sustainable is an urban future. It's one that involves you know, more people being more closely packed together in cities with big, complicated networks and infrastructures. Uh, it, you know, it's exactly the kinds of places that, you know, Klaus says, mean putting ourselves in harm, harm's way. So we, we need to build cities that are, are bigger and thicker and denser, but we also need to make sure that they're resilient and that they have stronger social and communications and power networks. And again, I think the question of our time is figuring out how to do that while also reducing our carbon emissions. It's a lot of fun to lay out a lot of really tough questions um, that I can't answer before the speaker that you're all waiting to hear uh, gets up to the stage, uh, to the mic. So, um, Chelsea, I'm sure that you've thought about answers to all those questions and, and can solve there. those problems for us. Um, Obviously not. But in the event that she doesn't get us all the way there, 
um, that's when, when you'll come in and we'll, and we'll open it up. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, Eric and Dale and Klaus and Heidi. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here at the Institute for Public Knowledge this evening. I think we certainly need to be having more conversations like this in more fora like this with more people like our panelists this evening informing them. Um, I want to start a little bit where Eric left off, not when he um, tossed it to me exhorting that I have all the solutions, but right before that, if you remember. In, in hopefully getting our panelists to talk a little bit about how we put questions like these on the agenda and keep them there until we get them answered. Uh, in the three presidential debates, which may seem like a distant memory ago, uh, climate change never came up. In the more than three dozen Republican debates, of which, yes, I did watch at least a third of them, um, climate change only came up insofar as it was a question to the candidates as to whether or not they believed it was happening. So the Republican candidates were never questioned or queried on what they would do to ameliorate our vulnerabilities or to adapt us to the inevitable, as Dale so painfully outlined. And it's hard then to have a conversation when the people who either are in power or who are inkling to be in power aren't being asked what their positions are and what they actually would do to manifest those positions into real policies that would shape our future or how even they define our future, whether they define our future as the next election cycle or the next 1,250 years or somewhere, probably more likely, in between those two poles. And yet we know from study after study that now more than two-thirds of Americans believe climate change is happening. But again, as we saw in this election cycle, and maybe this is somewhat due to the candidates not talking about climate change, Climate change never breached into the top three issues that people cared about or that people were planning to vote on in no study, in no part of the country. And that's deeply sobering. And yet we know that what Eric said is, is a barrier, but either we can also fall guilty of not figuring out and imagining a different way forward to help insert questions like these into the debates and the debaters that really can make a difference, or we can try to figure out how to not be disingenuous about the risks while empowering people, at least initially anecdotally, to ask the questions that really matter and then to hold our leaders accountable. And so I'd like to talk to our panelists a little bit about what they really think the core question should be and to whom should they be directed. Because one of the challenges I think we often have is that we don't know whether it's our mayor or our governor or our president that really should be held responsible for responding and that we ultimately then would hold accountable at the ballot box in the next election, whether the next election is a month, a year, or four years in the future. And so, you know, Eric, I'll start with you, but you know, what really do you think is kind of in the remit and the mandate of, of a mayor versus a governor versus the president? So I think actually, you know, we, we have this idea of home rule in the United States, this idea that you know, municipal governments control their fate. Um, and we think that that is restrictive. That makes it much more difficult to advance all kinds of policy issues, transportation, uh, pollution, things that are clearly regional or even beyond that and can't be handled at the local level. Um, th the truth is that, that mayors don't have much capacity to make progress on those things. We, we, we saw a great example of that when New York City tried to bring in the, the London 
uh, style policy for restricting cars from coming into the, to, into the city or essentially adjusting the pricing um, uh, for traffic coming in. The, the mayor was powerless because that was a, a, an issue that the state government had to... Well, which we saw in the aftermath of Sandy when sometimes it was the mayor and sometimes it was the governor talking to us about different bridges and tunnels. I think, I think that's right. And, and then there's MTA and all kinds of, of, of authorities. And that can be exceedingly confusing, so it makes it difficult to know how to channel political energy. So what I, w the way I'd answer your question uh, is to say, I think we have ne neglected to recognize the power of states uh, to, to establish policies on a bunch of issues like this. Uh, a lot of action really is at the state level. Um, and, and next I'd say we need fe clear federal leadership on dealing with climate change. And uh, I I'll make this point again. Uh, the really interesting question for me is whether and how we might change homeland security now that we've seen that we're predictably vulnerable from extreme weather in, in ways that are quite significant compared to the ways that we're vulnerable to terrorism. Uh, I think we should be having conversations about how we use our collective resources against these two different kinds of threats together. And I'll say that after Katrina, Congress recognized this and the, the acts, the congressional acts that reformed DHS and FEMA recognized that, that we had moved too much towards a, an anti-terrorist approach in Homeland Security and had neglected our tradition of doing all hazards training. But it was just a, a slight reform given the severity of this problem. I think we will need to have a, a full-on federal confrontation with this national and global threat. And do you see President Obama sharing that view from what you've heard? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's very tricky, right? Because uh, he, he did not talk about it uh, during the campaign. He, um, I, I think, believed that he had no incentive to do it, that he was not going to bring in any more voters by doing that. He seemed to believe that. After uh, Sandy, in his first press conference after being reelected president, he expressed his belief in climate change and his conviction that we need to do something about it for future generations. But what? That, that's the question, and, and that's the kind of thing that's going to, to get hammered out down the road. I'll, I'll say one other thing. It would be a mistake for us to just turn to our leaders and say, hey, do something. I, I, I believe that, you know, that change will come when we make it come. Uh, that's why I'm so interested in this Bill McKibben um, you know, 350, you do the math campaign that, that we're seeing on university campuses uh, around the country right now. That, that's why I'm interested in the, in, the surging enrollments uh, in environmental studies programs in universities around the country. I think younger generations understand that their future hinges on this and the future of their children hinges on this. And so whether or not that can be translated into a real political movement is crucial. And Dale, what can city and state and federal governments do to if not change the trajectory of the graph, at least you know, position us for a greater likelihood of success toward maybe the not quite best, but at least next best scenario. So I'm, I might find myself in the uncharacteristic role of the panel optimist, I don't know. But um, I mean, there's a big thing that hasn't happened in America, and that's putting a, a price on carbon at the, at the national level, and that's irreplaceable. I mean, it just simply has to happen. Um, but given that that hasn't happened, um, the U.S. has done fairly well in the, in the last four years. Um, the Obama administration increasing CAFE standards on new automobiles is hugely important. Um, states have acted, for example, through the REGI system of the northeastern states to do uh, a statewide greenhouse gas emissions. California's climate change law has come into effect now. There are very active mayors, not just in New York, but also in places like, like Seattle. Um, there's also been some, from a climate point of view, some dumb luck, uh, which is controversial, which has to do with fuel switching towards natural gas, which is made possible by something which has been very good for the economy of Pennsylvania, and not very popular in places like New York City. I won't even dare say the name. Um, I think what's in some ways 
Even more problematical is what happens on the adaptation side, because I'm serious about the fact that when it, if you're talking about really hardening infrastructure in places like New York City and in Florida, it's going to cost a whole lot of money. And you're going to have to get taxpayers from Kansas and Missouri and these places that are sometimes known as red states. <laughs> to, I never quite understand the color coding of American <laughs> politics, but that's another story. You know, to actually support those programs. And when it comes to the US keeping its international commitments to fund adaptation in vulnerable developing countries, that's going to be even more difficult still. And Klaus, what do you think the role of local, state, and federal governments are in trying to, um, I guess, precipitate the migratory pattern you were talking about and moving the deceased closer to the shoreline and, and the living um, to higher ground? I mean, what, you know, who, who, who really, or kind of which node of government really is best positioned um, to institute the building codes and kind of all the attendant requirements to encourage people to do that or to force people to do that? Well, we like to believe we are in a democracy. D does that mean you think we're not a democracy? And <laughs> purely a rhetorical question. Right? <laughs> um, I believe we live in a plutocracy. And we have to learn when it comes to the responsibility of government on all levels to start with ourselves. We should be a monocracy. We should govern ourselves. And then we can go up from there. So what would you recommend we each do in this room here this uh, evening? I would not wait for FEMA to set the rules where we built and at what height. You, your neighbor, and everybody else, affected or not affected, should ask themselves, A, where they built, how high they built, or whether it's time to move. And once you have done that, then you go to the village hall, to the town hall, to the county hall, maybe even to Congress and knock on the door, or to the voting box, and vote the right people that follow the same notion and put them into the places. And we haven't done that. And that brings up, of course, the role of the media as an institution of public education, haha. -ha. <laughs> I'm a geophysicist, but I can smell that things are not right. And Klaus, what about for the most vulnerable among us who couldn't move that to higher ground? That is the big thing. Uh, and that's why I think we live in a plutocracy. Because those who are most affected are often the one with the least resources and the least access to education which you need in order to make informed decisions. And so our education system, as much as it is uh, discussed, if you look and you ask me as a scientist, you know, we take all sorts of things serious, but a fact-based education is in short demand. Well, it is uh, interesting that with the introduction of the Common Core, um, which will largely govern education in 49 states when it's introduced in 2014, uh, focuses solely on English and math. So there's no uh, incorporation of civics. So for example, we're not kind of educating you know, our next generations to help ask and answer many of the questions that we're grappling with here this evening. You know, we're not teaching kids what to expect of their leaders uh, at the 
local, state, and national level. And we're also not necessarily teaching science, although science is on the future agenda for the Common Core. Uh, it wasn't included in the first tranche. Um, and Heidi, you, you were in the media, and you spent a lot of time actually trying to help people understand um, kind of what climate is and what it isn't and what influences it and what doesn't and how it can or hopefully does not impact people's lives. Um, what do you think the role of the media is in ensuring that once the kind of devastating images are no longer visible because the debris has been cleared up um, and people are returning home, and again, that's a separate question as to whether or not they should be. Um, what do you think the media's responsibility is to help continuing, to continue telling the anecdotes that will kind of invite people in and then equip them with the facts they really need to make the right choices for themselves, to Klaus's point, and also at the ballot box? I think the media has, has a really significant responsibility. And, you know, I, I guess you said it, you know, continue the conversation. And that's, I think that's the really hard part. You know, we're talking about things that play out over long time scales, and these are stories that are hard to tell, um, and they take a long time to tell. And it was interesting because you know you yourself was just were just saying that climate change never came up during the debates, right? So the media, in many respects, let us down there. There was a lot of sort of behind the scenes conversation about whether we could get those questions asked, and, and they didn't come up. And you know, for folks like me who have been talking about this for a long time, you know, we can, we've been talking about the fiscal cliff, right? Well, I, I kind of have been thinking about the climate cliff, which basically happened in about 2009 when we kind of fell off the climate cliff and, and we stopped talking about it. And, you know, within DC, climate really became the C word and it just, we couldn't talk about it. You know, we just, we, we could talk about weather and we could talk about long range weather patterns and, and things like that. Um, but, yeah. you know, I'll say though that I'm, I'm kind of hopeful again and, and despite the fact that it wasn't mentioned during the elections, it was really interesting because obviously when Sandy happened and a couple of our political leaders stepped up and started talking about it, that's huge. So the media plays a large role because the media gives us cues as to, as to what's important and what kind of conversations we need to have when, when the media is as, as good as it can be, right? And our political leaders are so important as well because we, we really do take our cues from them. And so, you know, the moment when Cuomo and Bloomberg and Chris Christie started talking about this, you know, suddenly it was okay again, right? So I think that, that continuing the conversation and sort of just realizing that we're kind of all in this together, you know, and, and I will just add to Eric's point, you know, we all know that, that there's, you know, there's the policy component and there's the regulation component and the fact that we have no price on carbon right now makes, makes the conversation really hard, right? Because it becomes a figment of our imagination on a certain level until we put a price on carbon. But interestingly enough, an NRC report came out a couple of weeks ago that, that really looked at this question of the intersection between climate risk, weather risk, and national security. And the NRC was essentially charged by the intelligence community to give them advice on how to integrate this kind of risk into their management planning. And really what they came up with was the fact that climate change means more surprises and it means more simultaneous surprises. So, you know, imagine the Moscow heat wave, the Thai floods, Hurricane Sandy, the US drought, and Russian wildfires all going on at the same time, right? That, that will happen. And then the national security risks become amplified. And you know, at the end of the day, the NRC report called for stress testing. And you know what? Sandy was a stress test. And Sandy showed us where our weaknesses are. And Even though so Klaus whole, already had. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. No, but, I mean, it, so we, just have to, we have to keep talking about it. We really do. I'm, I'm going to exercise my prerogative as the um, moderator to ask one more question, but then open it to the floor. So I hope you'll go to the microphones, which are on either side. Yes, either side. And, and please limit yourself to one question, as challenging as that might be. Um, you know, just to quickly echo uh, 
Heidi's emphasis on how important the linkage um, is between climate and security. Um, when the UN Security Council passed Resolution 1308, uh, which formally recognized the link between the HIV AIDS pandemic and growing destabilization uh, in Southeast Asia and throughout the continent of Africa, that was profoundly important um, because it got it on to the agenda of the CIA and onto the agenda of different House and Senate subcommittees that it never would have reached had the UN not formally recognized that link. And so I think oftentimes, you know, things that might seem sort of only distally important become actually quite, um, quite significant catalysts in unforeseen ways for at least widening the conversation. And before we widen the conversation here this evening, um, we've talked a little bit about um, what is working in some places, you know, whether it's the gates in Rotterdam and elsewhere in the North Sea, or whether it's certain you know, different building codes that cities have adopted or kind of migrating people more to higher ground. Um, are there things that outside of the oyster beds or the sea gates that any of you think should be in the conversation here in New York City as potential short or longer term solutions that are not currently in the conversation here here in New York? Klaus? Yeah, yeah the uh, term urban planning is about to be a central issue. Our urban planning is let the developer tell us what we should do. That's the level of urban planning we have. And while there are some, you know, very mild attempts to modify that, if you look, for instance, just at New York City, uh, I think it was yesterday that we announced, or the mayor rather announced, uh, that uh, the rail yard on the west side would be developed. And I take that as an example of short-sightedness. Um, you know, you can argue about this because there will be a platform over the yard, and then on top of that will be a huge one billion plus dollar development. The problem is that with sea level rise, you may want to raise those rail tracks if you want to keep that yard functioning, and uh, if the Long Island Railroad and others want to park their moving stock. You know, with rising sea level, you cannot do that without eventually raising those tracks. Well, if you have a deck, you know, you have to slice those rail cars in half in order to raise the, the tracks. Something is not quite working right. So what I'm saying is, uh, sure, you can make this deck maybe 40 or 50 feet high, and that would uh, bring more time but it's the kind of short-sightedness of decision-making that I'm pointing out. Are there any cities that you think do a particularly good job of urban planning in the United States? In the United States, probably the one that has spent more time and perhaps most time is San Francisco and to some degree Kings County, that's Seattle, Washington. Uh, New York City has been doing a lot of studies. <laughs> so maybe they should spend more time in the Institute for Public Knowledge, <laughs> linking ac <laughs> academia to the um, public policy dimensions. Any other comments on kind of what isn't being included as potential solutions here for New York or things that are working elsewhere that we should be paying more attention to? Dale, do you want to? Yeah. I just want to say, one thing about why it's so hard, you know? We talk, I mean, in this area of planning, we talk a lot about ideas like coastal retreat and moving people away from, from vulnerable areas. And, you know, there's a lot of small examples where that's happened. I mean, Boulder, Colorado is a good example where people used to live in the floodplain. Now, they don't anymore. It's a wonderful place for a park. It can flood. Everything's fine. 
We have this particular problem in New York because the, because the land that we would need to retreat from happens to be worth hundreds of billions of dollars. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one thing to talk about coastal retreat somewhere else, and it's another thing to talk about it in Manhattan. And that's just part of why it's such a difficult issue. So just to, to give the low-hanging fruit, um, disasters discriminate. We saw this in the heat wave in Chicago. We saw it in Katrina. We are seeing it again now. And we pretty much know the people and the places that are going to be most directly affected by different kinds of threats. And, you know, as Heidi told us, it's not like everything was fine, and then Superstorm Sandy arrived. We had a lot of advanced knowledge. And the same thing is true with, with heat waves, you know, which you should know kill more Americans in a typical year than all of the other so-called natural disasters combined. So, you know, we, we see them coming days and days in advance. So it, a, a city, here's an area where a, a city really can do something. Smart cities have now compiled databases of people who are old and live alone and are vulnerable or who are frail and need specialized assistance. And they can reach out to them in advance, many days in advance of a storm coming. Uh, they can see if they need to evacuate. They can provide special assistance. They can ask if they have made contact with neighbors. There are all sorts of very fundamental basic things that you could do to dramatically reduce the harm from the disasters that are coming. Now, this is a, a completely unsatisfying long-term solution. I'm not proposing it that way. It's, it's immediate. It's what you could do now for very little money. But I think that in addition to thinking about the big structural questions of how we will you know, find reliable, renewable energy sources and new ways of doing agriculture on a large scale and new ways of getting China and the United States to agree with each other in international diplomacy around you know, carbon emissions. You know, in the meantime, we really need to be thinking about the, the social and policy things that we can do to, to make things better, and that's one simple one. Which makes the New York Times article you referenced all the more troubling when we're that's always right. um, fighting our last proverbial war and responding to what happened during Irene instead of all of the forecasts that Heidi was detailing before. Why don't we start to the left? Do you want to ask a question? You, you, I can project. Awesome. Okay. It's working. It's working. It's working. Okay, there we go. I can also rely on that. <laughs> um, my name is Eric Barber, a freelance writer. Um, back on March 14, uh, 2011, our president, Mayor Bloomberg, on uh, storm surge protection um, and asking him to weave together the logic of building luxury housing and flood zones uh, while acknowledging the reality of climate change um, and through Plan YC and things like that. And uh, uh, he actually said, some intemperate things like that, saying that uh, uh, when people live here in the water, they know they're going to get wet. Um, so uh, the York One News says that they're digging up the videotape. They, well, they have the videotape and they're finding for it. So anyway, um, but I was referring to luxury housing, but public housing was placed on the waterfront uh, when no one wanted to be there. Uh, you know, when it was uh, far more polluted than it is today, uh, a couple generations ago. And that's still now baked in uh, to our city's infrastructure. Uh, what are your most creative ideas about the allocation of affordable housing and public housing uh, going forward uh, for people who really do not have the choice? They don't have the uh, choice of, of not buying that condo or buying extra insurance on that condo. Great. Let's take a few questions um, in each batch, and then we'll ask the panelists to answer. Yes. So we have questions about what are the solutions. I just spent all summer and fall interviewing uh, elected officials and planners in 40 communities from Maine to Virginia about their um, adaptations, and we're working on actually um, a system to measure their um, the efficacy and implementation. <coughs> uh, one of the most innovative ones, um, 
some of the panelists you mentioned, uh, coastal retreat. And we know there are examples of it. There are examples of it actually on the immediate shore. Ocean City, Maryland actually um, implemented a program about 20 years ago. Moved, moved the transfer development right back from its immediate shore, um, some couple hundred feet, to get, um, and it was the result of actually an intergovernmental uh, system that required, the federal government required them to do that as part of the beach reduction program. So without getting into technical details, my, my question is, there's still an enormous political problem when local governments make decisions about building communities. Staten Islanders, and it doesn't work this way anywhere, but it effectively does. Staten Islanders, when asked the question, if you live in Zone A in Staten Island, whether you would accept payment for the rights to the value of your house, to move those rights somewhere else in the city, as a new. It's a way of getting people to voluntarily move out of the flood zone. I think you can actually answer that question. Same problem on climate change mitigation. You have enormous opposition to density and development around transit stations. So how do we equate the balance of the politics so that the decisions can be made that are the right decisions? People are, have those choices. If at, at, the, at the local level. Yes. Denise Katzman, I want to thank you very much for holding such a uh, intelligent, just basic intelligent panel. Uh, there was a panel that was held on November the 15th at the NYC uh, Bar Association on Sandy and the aftermath, and it was an utter shambles. Uh, I'm not comparing you folks to them, but you folks are just plain and simply intelligent, and it's so beautiful. Uh, I have one question, but I just want to make a short announcement. There can is you, a volunteer coalition. Can you actually just focus on your question? The, the, I have to say this. It's really quick. OK. The word that Dale didn't want to say, I'm going to say it, fracking. We will not be fragged off this sacred, this sacred earth. Please go to saneenergyproject.org. We are a volunteer coalition of experts, and I have flyers if anyone would like to take them. My question is, how, how can we institute, regarding design build, passive house design? OK, thank you. And here. I'm uh, Maggie Clark. Uh, I've been an uh, adjunct professor for a number of years in the CUNY system. Um, and the thing about it is that, you know, people respond to incentives. And back when I was 20 years old, I was advising the Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management Agency when they asked me about the National Flood Insurance Program and its impact on Massachusetts coastal communities. And, wrote a 50-page paper and detailed how having inexpensive flood insurance would entice people to move to the coast and there would be more death and destruction. And this was in 1975. Uh, and, and this has been shown to be true, and it's becoming more true with climate change added on top of it. Um, the thing about it is that we have our incentives in the wrong direction. You know, we're encouraging people to act wrongly. Um, and, and we need to, as the, the one of the prior people had suggested the idea of, um, you know, giving money in order to move, in order to move out of the floodplain, have local zoning then zone it as parkland and beach forever once they have moved out of, of the floodplain, assuming that the house has become Similar to the, the question, Boulder example. The question is, how do we get the federal government to change this incentive uh, you know, in the correct direction towards buying out and moving rather than paying people to rebuild. All right, I think we'll take a couple more and then we'll let the panelists answer. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Ophelia and I'm a doctoral candidate here at NYU and I also live in Rockaway. And I have uh, witnessed many things in the past five weeks, but um, what I would like to bring to the room here is I've witnessed the utter failure of information flows in both directions, both about what's happening in Rockaway to the people who are in positions of power to either ameliorate what's going on or make policy decisions or whatever the case might be, and then also information to people in Rockaway um, about what's going on, both per, you know, about Sandy and what was going to happen, what was the forecast. Um, what was happening during the storm and obviously in the weeks since, um, and where we've gotten now to the point where we're facing many severe public health crises. 
So moving forward, you know, who is responsible for the maintenance of those information flows? What types of policy decisions should be made? Who should be addressing those? And in the event of a disaster, whether you call it natural or man-made, um, who should be responsible for maintaining those networks of communication, both in and out of these types of zones? Great question. Yeah. Hi, I'll keep it brief. Uh, thanks for your comments tonight. I work on an energy efficiency program uh, for a nonprofit in Queens. I just wanted to kind of push the what can we do question a little further. So if the panelists could each give us two things that everyone in this room could do, one more immediate, perhaps in the next week, um, to you know mitigate climate change and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in this country, and one more you know long-term big picture. I really appreciate it. Great. Um, I think we have three separate buckets of questions. Um, the, the last question, sort of what can we each do tomorrow um, and in the longer term? Uh, a second question around information and who ultimately is responsible for ensuring um, consistent, well-curated, reliable, and actionable information to people who are the most vulnerable, particularly when we know the systems, the information systems, themselves are not impervious to disasters. And then kind of a final bucket, which the first questioners were focused on, um, how do we incentivize, encourage, support people moving from the most vulnerable areas to less vulnerable areas? And what really are the different roles of different government actors um, and individuals in in that equation. Um, so maybe we could start with what I articulated as the third, but which really were the first batch of questions around around housing. Yes, Klaus. Um, I have a very practical suggestion uh, that addresses really the role of FEMA here. We have a fundamental problem that FEMA has two totally separate programs. One is disaster relief, and other is disaster mitigation. The divorce of those programs is fatal right now. Uh, people get money now to rebuild, quote unquote, which they shouldn't do. And then through a separate process, which happens three times a year with no relation to the occurrence of disasters or not, a community, the town, the city, anyhow, it's not an individual, can go to FEMA and ask for mitigation funding. After a disaster, these two things have to be combined because that's when you can do mitigation. So my mandate to Congress, because FEMA cannot do that on its own, is hit on your congressmen and senators to really change this, where mitigation becomes an, an element of a disaster relief, because that's when action happens. You know? And Eric, what about the question around affordable housing and, and the federal flood insurance program, um, which generally is uh, taken advantage of by lower income and lower middle income families? So again, those who are the most vulnerable, you know, to kind of point toward you, our resident sociologist, a couple of the questions that clearly have uh, inevitable and sometimes tragic social dimensions to them. So you're kind of getting back at me for uh, asking you to solve the problems in the beginning of the night. Wow. Revenge. Um, because of course that's a that's an enormously difficult question. So so I told you before I'm I'm native to Chicago. I've been here for a decade now, but did a lot of work so there. Do you consider yourself a New Yorker by now? Absolutely. From Excellent. the day after I arrived, Chelsea. The day Excellent. after I arrived. Um, and I hope you do too. Absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> so. Um, but this is a serious question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, 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 in Chica so in Chicago, because uh, we'll, we'll, we'll end the Borscht Belt uh, comedy here and now, uh, it, you know, in, in, in Chicago, which, you know, famously has uh, a, a, or had among the, the kind of worst, most dangerous public housing, vertical ghetto with concentrated poverty and high rates of violence 
Um, when the city and the federal government announced that they would be taking down the high rises, um, this generated an incredible backlash. Because while this housing was dangerous in ways that are analogous to ways that you know, coastal public housing, say in Rockaway, uh, is dangerous, it was also home, it was also community, it was a, a source of, of meaning, and people were reluctant to leave it. So we can learn from that story. And, and what happened that, next? That, so so, so wh where we can learn is you know, people did leave with certain in incentives. The incentive in this case was the wrecking ball. Um, uh, but, but Chicago dispersed these um, public housing residents you know, throughout the city's poorest neighborhoods. So they moved to other neighborhoods that looked a lot like the place that they had come from. And they lost the communities that they had spent so much time building up, which meant it was not a great solution for them. Moreover, the city started evicting them before it really had a strategy for where to put them. So if you are going to ask people who live in low-lying, vulnerable areas to move, if you're going to force them or incentivize them to, do, to move, I think one thing you need to do is think really carefully about the kind of place you're going to invite them to move into. Create, create housing that works for the way we live now. You know, so for instance, I talked about the fact that um, we know who's most at risk, and they're oftentimes older people who live alone and are vulnerable. And you know, we live at a time when there are more people like that than ever before in history, and that's part of this formula for disaster we're in. A lot of older people live in subsidized housing. They are, live alone, but they want to be connected to others. They want services. They want public areas for support. We, we have a crisis anyway, regardless of the climate. We need to find realistic housing solutions for the way that we live and we age now. So if we're going to start moving people, let's not just kick them out. Let's think really creatively about f how we could build better places to live. And safer. And safer, right. And safer. Um, why don't we save the what can and should we all do to the very end and take one more batch of questions for the panelists? Yes. Um, I'm currently an undergraduate student at NYU, and my question has to do with political accountability. You've all talked a lot about national political accountability, but my question has to do with raising it to the international level. Do you believe that implementing a legal framework to address such accountability, such that American actions don't continue to affect countries like Bangladesh, needs to be implemented? Thank you. We here. Hi, uh, Tim Keating with Rainforest Relief. Uh, I'm kind of the person who fought the city for the last 15 years to try to get them not to use tropical hardwoods, mostly on the boardwalks uh, mm. that uh, are, have now been washed away. incredibly, ironically, washed away by the storm, fueled by the very climate change, fueled by the logging of that very rainforest. Uh, and, I, and I say that having just walked across this floor, which I, I you know is probably Santos Mahogany, I could guess about 10 acres were, were cleared uh, or, or allowed in the Amazon to, to provide it. And I say that to, to, uh, to bring up a question, which is, uh, you know, looking at the future of New York City and the impact of uh, um, carbon emissions, how do we get people to realize to be able to, in the equation of who's responsible for carbon emissions, to be able to realize that you know it's not just where a product is manufactured, it's who buys it and who uses it. Is New York uh, supposedly called the most, you know, one of the most sustainable places to live in because we're all squashed together and using mass transit, and therefore our carbon emissions per capita are low in terms of our transportation. But we have to have one of the highest rates of throughput of stuff yep. of anywhere in the world. So all of that manufacturing that's going on in China and Brazil and the rainforest and whatnot is ending up here. So who's responsible? Is it the buyer who imported the wood? Is it New York City who ended up yep. using the wood? Or is it the manufacturer in Brazil? That's never ever mentioned in the equations of how much carbon emissions are New Yorkers responsible for. Yeah, I think I think just one question, there, unfortunately, just because there's so many people standing behind you. And and to your right, my left. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you all for all your wonderful um, information about this topic. I'm just happy to go with my um, environmentalist book, working both in the secular and sacred realms. Uh, my question has to do with both mitigation and adaptation. 
Uh, we do know that the only agreed upon number at Copenhagen was two degrees Celsius. We cannot get above two degrees Celsius. Um, James Hansen and Bill McKibben identified 350 parts per million CO2 is the number we have to stay at. It was 280 at the time in the Industrial Revolution. We're now about 294. So we do have to get down. We can make choices. And, yes, ma'am. Over gas. And what's your question? Uh, I'm sorry. My question, to... uh, and the adaptation is just very briefly Taiwan. We do have a relationship with Taiwan. And um, some people from Taiwan said they would have slept in sand because they have typhoons there. So we are working with them on adaptation on a federal level. What are some of their adaptation techniques for cities? But my question is this if we're really going to do adaptation seriously, as Mr. Jameson said, we have to think of the globe. And the previous student just mentioned, uh, we have to think of mitigating and getting down the fossil fuels. Um, I am concerned about the TPP, which is a global agreement that could greatly decrease our ability to maintain our environmental laws and safety standards. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Julie Ashcraft, independent journalist, Rolling Stone Middle East, and do uh, uh, uh Very thankful that we were not having problems with the Fukushima-like situation at Indian Point Nuclear Plant during the storm. Um, also, that's a big, huge thing to talk about in terms of evacuation and the possible outcomes from huge storms. Also, uh, would you like to address the fact that sometimes climate change is uh, framed really as a carbon question and in favor of nuclear energy, which is supposedly green, but in fact it's very dangerous to operate nuclear plants during big storms, which may be related to climate change. And also, would you like to address uh, the possible weaponization of weather as part of the military-industrial complex? Yes. Uh, Jeff Howard, uh, visiting scholar in environmental studies here at NYU. Uh, I would ask the panel for a brief reaction to the idea that uh, mitigation of climate change is an especially important consideration in the context of adaptation to climate change. That it's a key area, adaptation is a key opportunity for us to push mitigation of climate change emissions, of greenhouse gas emissions, into the public eye. It's a key place to uh, push for the kinds of changes that over the long term uh, that will mitigate climate change. And it's a key moral uh, place for uh, addressing mitigation, our mitigation obligation. Thank you. Yeah, I think this will be our last question. Thank you. Um, with, with my apologies to everyone standing in line still. Yes. No pressure. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. My name is Crystal Lehman. Um, one of you guys mentioned there's a term, actually, unofficially, environmental refugees. Uh, we see it in the Maldives, and we see it in the Marshall Islands. And now we're actually seeing it in developed countries as our own in America. If maybe you guys can talk about where that's going, or how that can be remedied, or it's just so new that it's not even explored yet. Great, Thanks. thank you. Um, so clearly lots of questions about our global responsibility and our global community, which is something that Dale touched on earlier. Um, so I don't know who wants to start with what. Yes. Um, I start with the last one. Um, the United Nations has no statute for climate refugees. It has a statute what to do about political refugees uh, but there is none for climate refugees. And we see it when the Marshall Islands and uh, other Pacific Islands or the Maldives ask for admission to Australia because it's the nearest continent. There was huge political uh, upheaval about that. And I think the time has come that on the United Nations levels, with, and it's not clear how that will happen because there is so much uh, resistance, of course, by the main emitters, not just the old admitter, emitters, but also the new ones like China that has exceeded uh, the US in greenhouse gas emissions and or India, maybe Brazil, Sumatra following, uh, Indonesia following soon. 
uh, that it has not a very good chance to pass a statute. So these islands have done a very clever thing. They asked the International Court in Den Haag just to make a judgment, not damning the emitters, whether or not greenhouse gases are a means to extinguish or diminish the livelihood of nations. And I think we have to think how the political process on a national, international level can help support them. And that is closely linked, of course, to a Kyoto-type protocol that the nations that are the emitters set funds aside to make sure that not only is a law available for taking up those climate refugees, but also the means to, to implement it. And Dale, what do you think? Yeah, so um, there, there's really too much here to try to address everything in detail. So I just really want to make a couple larger points. The, the, the first thing is that evolution did not build us to respond to the dangers caused by emitting colorless, tasteless trace gases into the atmosphere that would have impacts that would last thousands of years in the future around, around the globe. Uh, so it's not surprising that we're bad at dealing with these issues. What I think this discussion have really exposed is that we have these very tightly coupled, complex social systems, urban systems, energy systems, and scientific systems that all in some way work together to maintain a particular state. Uh, it involves you know, the way we have elections. It involves um, the bad incentives we have for rebuilding, our failure to think globally, our transportation systems, a, lo a lot of stuff that's been mentioned. When you start to break out of that incrementally, things become very difficult. So Eric, for example, mentions doing, you know, creating centers to take care of vulnerable people who are under threat uh, from extreme weather events. Great thing to do, but it's happening against the background of a system where people may not get health care, they may not have nutrition, they may not have anyone else to take care of them in other contexts of, of, of their lives. So there's some things we can do incrementally and invisibly and it's great to do as much as we can do, but what's really needed here is some large change of state in all of these systems, in the way that they connect to each other, in the way they reinforce each and, other. And thinking of them as an ecosystem. And thinking of them as an ecosystem. Now, how can this happen? Two quick things. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, you have to make the world safe. Citizens have to make the world safe for political leaders to lead. And in a small way, the anti-smoking movements are like that. You can only get political leaders to ban smoking in public places after a lot of people stop smoking in the, in, in the first place. And, and there are analogs to this in climate-related areas that have to do with transportation and so on that I'm not going to go into. But that's the first point. The second thing, which no one's mentioned, is we need a much larger investment in all kinds of research. Because even for those of us, most of the panel has been emphasizing the importance of the social side of all these issues, which I'm firmly on board. But sometimes there can be big changes in hardware that, that lead to reconceptualizing the problems in different ways, particularly with energy. And we haven't been doing those investments. Eric, what do you think, particularly around the question of um, how do we help people really determine what their actual carbon footprint is, even those of us who pride ourselves on using reusable water bottles and riding the subway? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a hard thing, and, I'm, and I might not be the right you know, expert on, on that. I, I know, for instance, that uh, you know, we're starting to make a greater investment in updating uh, the power grids so that they are smarter, uh, which could mean any number of things, but one of which uh, means that you know, users of electricity at home we'll can have, have a better ways, sense yeah. of understanding how much they use and when they use it and when they're using it at, at peak moments when they really should be using less of it and at a bottom minimum. Uh, you know, we should have a more resilient uh, power grid. And, and I guess I want to use that to segue to a point I'd make to, to engage with Dale a little bit on the point, on the issue of, you know, having places to take care of vulnerable people during crises. We need to recognize that the people who are vulnerable during crises are generally people who, and places that are vulnerable every day, 
there's a clear connection between the two of them. And I think we also need to recognize that an intelligently designed homeland security apparatus would not just protect people during crises, they would help to improve the quality of life every day. This, if you think about it, is the very opposite of what we've done with homeland security. If you think about all, and my colleague Harvey Malich has written this brilliant book against security, which details all the ways in which the, in the machinery of homeland security has made our lives hell. And maybe they'll work if there's a terrorist attack, but maybe not. Can we think more creatively and expansively about what it would look like to build systems that help us every day and, and also during crises? And very quickly, I want to make sure I answer um, Ophelia's question about the communications infrastructure and the fact that she, you know, people in, in Rockaway couldn't get information and people uh, above and political offices didn't seem to have the knowledge that they needed. We have a, a, a feeble communications network given the challenges that we face. Um, it was amazing to see communications break down uh, around Sandy, but communications break down even in the most mild uh, problem, when they're mild problems, and even on hot summer days. Um, we need to find a, a way to inform ourselves and to inform our leaders uh, of what's happening. And the new networks we have, while having all kinds of cool features, uh, are not as resilient as, as they need to be. And this also needs to be on the table. So there are a whole array of, of policy um, changes we could make that would work for both the normal and the extreme. Yeah, Heidi, do you have any thoughts around the question of communications resiliency? Yeah, I mean, I was so incredibly struck by Ophelia's remarks. And, you know, I sit here and I, I think about, you know, these, these smartphones. And right now, we knew that we, we issued a great forecast four days out. We knew what to expect with respect to, you know, wind speed. The storm surge forecasts were fairly good. But we need to continue to, you know, in the science jargon, downscale them, right? And so the kinds of things that we saw play out in Breezy Point and in Far Rockaway, we need to be able to take this information from our, our larger weather models, downscale them, you know, and, and we hear on the local news all the time this term, the pinpoint forecast. We need to do that. We need to do that so that you can get a storm surge forecast directly to your phone that actually can tell you how it impacts your house. We can actually do this, but right now there's no leadership, there's no infrastructure, and there's no will to do it. So I think this kind of comes back to the question of moving forward, how do we respond and build the kinds of communication platforms that we need? Because we've, you know, we've got these phones, but you know, we don't just need the forecast. We, we need that pinpoint information. So actually, I've, I've been thinking about that um, and that one of my friends recently found out that she was pregnant and she's already downloaded all these apps onto her phone, a couple of which are actually customizable for her kind of various health states to tell her what's happening, you know, every week or even for some every day of her gestation. And, well, I guess her baby's gestation, since Eric laughed at me. And... And why couldn't we have something similar for disasters, where you know, here's what you can really expect. You can plug in different variables so that there's some dynamic, like depending on the category of storm, how close you live to the coast, what the characteristics of your house are. If, you know, like that old story, you're living in a house of mud or brick or straw. You know, how many stories is it, and et cetera. And why couldn't we have those types of smart applications that really could give people actionable information in advance in so far as they did have good forecasts, because if the networks fail, we still want people to feel as if they're somewhat empowered over what are fundamentally disempowering situations. Um, and I know we didn't get to the question with kind of everyone being succinct about the things to do tomorrow and into the future, but I think we did get a lot of interesting, provocative, um, and useful information, at least I certainly did. Um, so I'm going to give it to Eric to close us out for the well, evening, well, and thank well, you all for coming. Well, thank you, Chelsea. And you know, we we know about your many talents, but I think mobile app entrepreneur <laughs> developer was not you know one we knew of before. So um, we'll be reading about you in oh. Fortune or Forbes soon. O only when you help me, Eric. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I want to thank this incredible panel, uh, each of you who brought something really different and unique to. 
uh, of, of what is, in fact, a very crowded conversation. It's hard to say something that's really provocative because we've been talking about it so much, but I think every single one of my panel colleagues and panel co-panelists up here tonight did that. Universities are in the news a lot these days because we ask what universities are for and why we should make investments in them and why they're worth supporting and whether we could just do it online and through the internet for free. I wanna say that you know, there's a lot of chatter in the world about all kinds of problems, but when we do our jobs well here, we take time away from some of the daily demands that most people face and, and really generate the kind of, of thoughtful responses to the problems of our times that help us make advances. That's, that's what we can do best in a number of different fields. Um, it's what IPK is committed to, it's what I think NYU is committed to, and uh, I, I hope that all of us can find ways to make universities do more of these kinds of things uh, because we owe something to the public as well. Um, thanks for being here, and I truly hope that this is um, just one of many future conversations you have about this. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.